For nearly 140 years, the people of the Democratic Republic of Congo have suffered. From the horrors of colonialism to a series of bloody civil wars via a brutal Western-backed dictatorship, the story of this country in Central Africa is a grim one, but it needs to be told. What we now call the Democratic Republic of Congo has had many names over the past century and a half, but again and again, it has been failed by those who are supposed to be its protectors, both by the so-called peacekeepers of the international community and by the Congolese politicians who promised to lead the nation to prosperity. On this episode of Untangling Africa, we turn our attention to Congo and to one of the most tragic tales in the history of the continent, a tale that is sadly not yet at an end. This is Untangling Africa and this is the Congo Crisis, where the dream of independence gave way to Africa's longest period of conflict and turmoil. Of the many brutal accounts to emerge from the European colonization of Africa, some of the most barbaric originate from the very heart of the continent, from the Congo Free State. Congo was not a typical European colony, this was no extension of political power or economic policy stretching from Western Europe into the lens of Africa. Instead, this was something different. Congo existed in a personal union with Belgium. A colony not of the state of Belgium, but rather of her ruler, King Leopold II, who took the territory for his own. For 23 years, Leopold did what he wanted with his personal empire. He ran the economy into the ground, brutalized the local population, waged wars, and executed neighboring leaders. Under Leopold's rule, the Congolese were subjected to sickening abuse and persecution. Draconian penalties underpinned law and order, and stories of the armed units of the force publique, requiring a human hand for every bullet expended to prove the bullet had not been wasted, have become part of the fabric of the region's ugly colonial history. Finally, in 1908, Leopold lost control of his personal kingdom, the kingdom he had never personally visited. The Congo Free State was taken over by Belgium, becoming the Belgian Congo and falling into line with other European holdings in the region, like German East Africa or the French Congo, exploited, inhibited, but still just about functioning as a state. And yet still, the scars of Leopold were visible upon the land. The ghost of the former personal emperor, who had died in 1909, still loomed large. The nation, or nations, of Congo had been broken by Leopold, and the seeds of violence had been sown so abundantly that it was only a matter of time before they burst through the soil and bore fruit. But other seeds had been sown too. In the final years of Leopold's grip on the Congo, the Belgian company Union Minerais du Haut Katanga, also known as the UMHK or the Mining Union of Upper Katanga in English, was granted the exclusive right to mine copper in the Katanga region in the southwest of the Congo. In 1914, as part of the newly formed colony of the Belgian Congo, Katanga would gain province status, becoming an economic powerhouse for the state. 33.7% of the total revenue of Congo came from copper mining in Katanga, which was controlled exclusively by the UMHK. Even after Congo was absorbed into Belgium's empire, the legacy of Leopold II remained in the form of the mining interests granted during his personal rule. And even after Congo gained independence in 1960, the Belgian government would be reluctant to give up its stake in such a lucrative enterprise. The UMHK had regional power, it had money, it had the backing of Europe. To say the Second World War hit Europe hard is a massive understatement. The continent was crippled by the conflict that ripped through it from 1939 to 1945, and in the decades that followed, those countries that still held lingering colonial power struggled to keep it together. One of those countries was Belgium, and this had a significant effect on the political landscape of the Belgian Congo. By the 1950s, change was in the air, and revolution was being discussed in alarmingly real terms. As the decade progressed, 
Colonial administrators found themselves struggling to contain the fire of local dissent. When the government back in Belgium turned up the pressure, local administrators began to manipulate the facts until flashpoints and violent incidents simply went unreported. The Belgian Congo was spiraling toward chaos, but Belgium herself remained blissfully unaware of the true gravity of the situation. On January 4th, 1959, Belgium became very, very aware. Rioting broke out in the colony's capital, Leopoldville, another legacy of the former king. 34 Congolese were killed after an attempted meeting of the anti-colonial political party Alliance des Congo, or ABACO, was broken up by Belgian forces. The bloodshed in the capital lit the fuse for revolution across the country. Flashpoints grew in frequency and the Belgian administrators, their hands tied by the bureaucratic process, could not effectively punish those involved. This emboldened the local masses, and when the Parti Solidaire Africain emerged in May 1959, it rapidly gained support. The Belgian government now had a simple choice. Either give the people the elections they craved, or lose control of the region altogether. But even at this late stage, the colonial authorities had more tricks up their sleeve. They called an election, but backed their own puppet candidates in an attempt to placate the people. The Parti Soldat Africain, now allied with the Abaco, was outraged. And this meant the people were outraged too. A boycott was called. The Belgians responded by arresting men who refused to vote, but their efforts were in vain. Turnout among white Belgians was high, but in Congolese areas, it was woeful. In the Quilu region, a little more than 1% of those eligible actually voted in the populated Quilu district, while voting numbers were somewhat higher elsewhere. Belgium was forced back to the negotiation table with its tail between its legs. New elections were called. This time, they would be fair and free, and the Parti Soldat Africain would be involved. There was only one outcome, and on June 30th, 1960, Congo declared independence from Belgium. From the private plaything of a European king, to an official colony, to an independent state, all in a little over half a century, but still the strife and violence that had plagued Congo for so long refused to go away. The cracks in the new state began to form almost immediately. Up to now, we've talked about the people of the Congo as a homogenous whole, but in truth, this is far, far too simplistic. There are more than 200 distinct ethnic groups inhabiting the vast Congo region, each with its own culture, history, and outlook. This enormous diversity fractured the Parti Soldat Africain, and local disagreements effectively killed the party right on the cusp of a new age. According to the journalist David Reed, Reporting from Congo for the US News and World Report, the dream of independence and autonomy for those who had lived through decades of colonial oppression quickly died. African officials suddenly were big shots, rode around in fancy cars, and took over elaborate homes, Reed wrote. In short, they replaced a white aristocracy with a black aristocracy. But there was more to come. The force publique had provided the military power in the region since the days of Leopold II, and even in the days following independence, consisted of black Congolese soldiers serving under white Belgian officers. When the African soldiers of the Belgian officered force publique saw what was happening, Reed added, they wanted their shit. On July 8th, barely a week after independence, they mutinied and a fresh crisis erupted. Belgium, desperate to evacuate their citizens amid reports of violence and retribution from soldiers and civilians alike, sent in special forces units to bring Belgians back to Europe. Not all Belgians were so quick to abandon Congo, however. The UMHK still controlled the mining copper in the southern province of Katanga, and the UMHK in turn was controlled by European interests, chiefly Belgian interests, but also British and French too. The lure of mineral wealth, of money, proved strong. The UMHK and its European backers began to conspire, working with a local Katangan politician to protect their massive investment in the south of the new nation. 
This politician was Moise Chombe, a man who has since become synonymous with the unfolding Congo crisis. On July 11th, less than two weeks after independence and only three days after the forced public mutiny, Chombe announced the formation of another state, the independent states of Katanga. Belgium, France and the United Kingdom did not publicly acknowledge this new state, but this did not stop them from backing Katanga financially and militarily. Flouting UN regulations, European soldiers even joined Chombe's army as mercenaries. In a matter of weeks, Congo had already begun to disintegrate and Katanga, with powerful European friends, looked like it would be sticking around. History is never simple. To write Katanga's secession off as a purely financial move, a power play from neo-colonialists in Brussels, Paris and London is just too easy. Was Chombe simply a puppet for a new form of economic imperialism? Francis Terry McNamara, who served as an officer at the US Consul in Elizabethville, also known as Lumbumbashi in Katanga during the crisis, didn't think so. Chombe was a man of great charm, great charm and intelligence, a good leader. The idea that he was just a creature of neo-colonial influences is a gross exaggeration and misunderstanding of fact, McMurray said in a 1993 interview. Like most African political leaders, his support was tribally based. He openly opposed the central government. In the beginning, he was manipulated to a degree by the Belgians, the French and the British, but they didn't create his authentic local report. People's only real identification is still with tribe and region. Congo is an artificial creation of the colonial powers. European nations protecting their business interests, local ethnic and tribal groups dissatisfied with the new Congolese order. McNamara's words really highlight the complexity of the situation here in Central Africa at the beginning of the 1960s. But this complexity doesn't end here. Along with tribal divisions, there were ideological divisions too, which would put Congo at the heart of simmering international tensions. The independent Congo state had been declared after democratic elections and the reluctant agreement of the former colonial powers. In the eyes of the world, this was a legitimate nation, one that deserved the support and assistance afforded to other nations with a seat at the table of the United Nations. Patrice Lamumba, a democratically elected prime minister of the fledgling country under President Joseph Kasavubu, appealed to the UN for help in ending Katangan secession and halting the slide toward all-out war. When the UN refused, Lumumba made a decision that would cost him his office and ultimately his life, and would add a whole new international dimension to the conflict. He turned to the Soviet Union. Lumumba never referred to himself as a socialist or a communist. He was an African nationalist at heart and avowedly so. But by looking to the USSR at the time of enormous tension between the West and the communist bloc, Lumumba's actions spoke louder than his words. After a string of communist victories in Asia, the West was not about to let a vast swath of Central Africa fall under the influence of Moscow. In one sense, Lumumba's gamble paid off. The UN and the United States, alarmed by the idea of Soviet weapons in an African civil war, sprung into action. In February, the UN passed Security Council Resolution 161, authorizing all appropriate measures to prevent civil war in the country. Attempts by the UN to find a diplomatic solution to the crisis were dealt a crushing blow that September when Secretary General Doug Hammarskjöld's plane crashed in suspicious circumstances in Zambia, on its way to a secret rendezvous with Chombe, killing all on board. The green light was essentially lit for international military action in Katanga. The Katangan state, even with its unofficial European mercenaries, could not hold out. By January 1963, Katanga's secession was quashed and Chombe rejoined Kasavubu's government as prime minister later in 1964. In almost all other senses though, Lumumba's gamble did not pay off, not even close. Lumumba was deposed as Prime Minister of Congo in November 1960 after only months in office. He would not live to see UN intervention in his country as he was murdered in custody in 1961 before Resolution 161 had passed. 
The death of Patrice Lumumba has been the source of much controversy and conjecture. What's almost certain is this. On January 17th, the deposed Prime Minister, along with two associates, faced a firing squad on the grounds of a private villa in Katanga. The three men were shot to death, their bodies buried in shallow graves, before being exhumed, dismembered and dissolved in sulfuric acid. What's less certain is how this came about. Belgian officials likely oversaw the execution while Katangan authorities likely carried it out. At the same time, it is known that CIA agents made attempts on Lumumba's life in the period of tumult following his election, while a memo from the British Foreign Office suggested removing Lumumba from the scene by killing him. Whatever involvement outside elements had in Lumumba's death, by 1965, the civil war was declared over and Congo was unified under a new leader. The age of Mobutu had begun. Colonel Joseph Desari Mobutu was a master operator and strategist. He knew which horse to back and he knew how to get what he wanted. In the summer of 1960, Mobutu offered his tacit support to President Kasavubu in his attempts to get rid of Lumumba. When Lumumba raised an army to depose the president in September 1960, Mobutu struck and seized power. Five months later, in another strategic gear change, Mobutu handed power back to Kasavubu, who placed Mobutu at the head of the armed forces. In the bloody chess game that was Congolese politics in the 1960s, this was a significant blunder. By 1965, President Kasavubu was vulnerable and Mobutu moved again. He seized power in a coup and retook the presidency. He would remain there through a combination of international brinksmanship and brutal political oppression for over 30 years. While in power, Mobutu would change his name. Joseph Desiree was no more. Mobutu Sese Seko was in charge now. Or, to give him his full title, Mobutu Sese Seko Koko Ngbendu Wazabanga, the all-powerful warrior who, because of his endurance and inflexible will to win, will go from conquest to conquest, leaving fire in his wake. The permanent return of Mobutu Sese Seko, the all-powerful warrior, to power in Congo was the first in a string of major failures from the United Nations. In 1963, after the reintegration of Katanga into Congo, it was announced that the UN's presence in the country was to be phased out. In the months leading up to their withdrawal in 1964, the priority of the UN forces shifted to the retaining of the Congolese military, with a view of achieving long-term stability in the region. This military was under the direct control of Commander-in-Chief Mobutu, and this retraining effectively gave Mobutu the tools to seize power in the 1965 coup. What followed was decades of conflict and misery for the people of Congo. First came violent mutiny in 1966, when 2,000 Katanga Gendarmes loyal to Chombe, now in exile in Spain, rebelled against the Kisangani. A year later, when Chombe was kidnapped and put under arrest in Algeria, a second mutiny broke out in Kisangani. Both were brutally put down. A third rebellion in 1967 was moderately more successful, but still ended in bloody struggle and significant loss of life. In 1971, Mobutu rebranded Congo as Zaire, seeking to create an authentic national identity that all Congolese could rally around. For most in the country, however, this authenticity meant very little as Mobutu's regime plundered the land and crippled the economy of the mineral-rich nation. With all other parties outlawed, Mobutu's popular movement of revolution or MPR was unchallenged and the dictator was free to run his own economic strategies, often at the expense of the nation as a whole. Outside of Zaire, however, there was opposition. The Congolese National Liberation Front, or FLNC, was active in neighboring Angolia and gathering significant strength. In 1977 and 1978, the FLNC launched two incursions into Katanga, by now known as Shaba. Morocco intervened on the side of Mobutu in 1977 and helped push back the invaders. In 1978, France got invoked, assisting Mobutu's forces as they retook control of Shaba. In both cases, the loss of life was staggering. 
The invasions may have been unsuccessful, but they gave Zairians something to cling to. Anti-Mobutu sentiment grew in the country through the 1980s and seemed to have some effect, as the NPR government found itself under increasing pressure to liberalize and democratize Zaire. While the Cold War raged, Western nations opted to turn a blind eye to the abuses of power and rampant mismanagement taking place in Zaire. But with the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1989, the tide began to turn. Suddenly, a strong, Western-aligned Zaire was of little importance to the Americans and to the European Union, and former backers in the US, France, and Belgium began to push for democratic change. Now, some three decades after the Belgian colonial administration found themselves running out of options, it was Mobutu who had no choice. In 1990, Mobutu declared Zaire a multi-party state, but just a month later, scores of students were massacred following a protest at the University of Lumbobashi. Tiring of Mobutu, France cut back on its aid payments to Zaire in 1991. For around 100 days in 1994, Hutu nationalists rampaged through Rwanda, murdering up to 800,000 people, mainly of Tutsi ethnicity. The Rwandan genocide, its horrors, and the failure of the UN to meaningfully prevent the atrocities that took place during this period are well documented and are subjects for another video. While scenes of desperate refugees fleeing across the Zairean border shocked onlookers from across the world, few actually wondered what these referees were fleeing into. Far less well documented are the tribal conflicts and sickening bloodshed that were ripping through Zaire in those years. Many of these refugees who sought safety and successfully made it through to Zaire had only traded one set of killers for another. From the beginning of the 1990s through to the Rwandan genocide and beyond, hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives in tribal conflicts throughout Zaire as the country descended into chaos once again. The UN condemned the human rights situation in 1997, but once again did essentially nothing to protect those in harm's way. For Mobutu, the end was at hand. The emergence of a multi-party system had not gone well for the self-styled, all-powerful warrior, and there's now a real opposition to the leader and his ruling NPR party. Opposition that spilled over into the Second Congo Civil War in 1996. But Mobutu was facing another threat. Cancer. With his health ailing and his enemies circling, Mobutu sought treatment in France in December 1997. While he was out of the country, rebel forces struck. The country fell within months, and the rebel leader, Laurent Kabila, declared victory on March 29th. Mobutu fled the Zaire in May, entering exile in Morocco, and succumbed to his cancer that September. The UN's failure in the Congo crisis was as complex as it was disastrous. But what actually went wrong? Just like in Rwanda in 1994, the United Nations can be accused of inaction in Congo in 1960. Appeals for assistance from a democratically elected leader went unanswered, driving a fledgling nation elsewhere for assistance and dragging the conflict onto the world stage as the Cold War rapidly threatened to become hot. Was the United Nations manipulated by other parties? Possibly. Soviet involvement in the Congo crisis certainly caught the attention of the United States and other Western governments. The murder of Patrice Lumumba in 1961 was a catalyst for the United Nations Resolution 161. But the allegations of Western involvement in this killing remain highly suspicious. UN and US forces were brutally successful in Katanga in 1963, but at other times they were found lacking. In 2004, a UN peacekeeping detachment in the eastern DRC Sashwawandan borderlands was ordered to withdraw by Rwandan army units. Despite their mandate, the peacekeepers withdrew, underlying how toothless the United Nations forces have been at various points in this seemingly endless cycle of war. It's also important to remember Dar Hamashot. It's been alleged that the UN Secretary General's fatal plane crash in 1961 was not an accident at all, but rather a planned assassination. This hasn't been confirmed, but a reported explosion on the plane shortly before it came down suggests a possible intentional killing. If this were true, 
It demonstrates the lengths the UN's enemies were willing to go to end foreign intervention in the region. UN forces preparing to leave Congo in 1963 turned their attention toward training and preparing the Congolese military. This essentially gave Colonel Mobutu the very means he needed to seize power when the time was right. Some of the accusations made against UN forces are far darker than in action, error or manipulation. In 2008, it emerged that 150 allegations of sexual abuse had been brought against UN forces in Congo. According to then UN Secretary General himself, Ban Ki-moon, there was clear evidence that acts of gross misconduct have taken place. Even in this century, the people of Congo are being brutalized by those who were sent there to protect them. You might have spotted something just then. The dates. Mobutu died in 1997, ousted by a similar rebellion to the one that had swept him to power. A new government was formed under Laurent Kabila. Zaire became the Democratic Republic of Congo, which it remains to this day. And yet, our timeline does not end here. These incidents in 2004 and 2008 are not isolated. They're products of yet another cycle of war that struck the country after Mobutu was gone. In 1998, the Third Congo Civil War broke out when Lorin Kabila ordered all Rwandan and Ugandan forces and government officials out of the country following his victory the previous year. These Rwandans and Ugandans, once allies of Kabila, did not leave. Instead, they joined up with rebel groups inside the DRC and mounted an armed insurrection against the Congolese leader. Over five years of war that involved 10 African countries, an estimated 5.4 million people died. This was the bloodiest conflict since the Second World War. Even now, Congo's torment is not yet complete. As recently as 2022, armed groups were still struggling for control in areas of the DRC. And the situation remains desperate. For the people of Central Africa, the misery that began in the 1800s now spans three centuries and it shows no sign of coming to an end. For the United Nations, the wounds of past mistakes are being reopened and the organization's great shame lingers on. We can only hope for something better in the future. The people of the Democratic Republic of Congo certainly deserve it. What do you think? How much were United Nations forces to blame for the Congo crisis? the effects of which are still being felt to this day. What hope do the DRC and her people have in these coming years? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.